Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Tuesday, January 24th, 2017 edition of VR News. Lots to talk about, lots of game updates. We're going to start with those. Let's start with the obvious one. Launch today, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. Super looking forward to this. Picked it up on the way home from work. And that part of the label right there is the reason why. PlayStation VR mode included. I know there's a few of you who could care less about this game. But for those who do, the quick look will be up after this uh, news video. Probably going to do a little bit longer than the usual. I'm thinking 20 to 30 minutes. Probably in two parts as a quick look game. I think I can get away with a little bit more and still be non-spoilerish because of the length of the game being a lot longer than a lot of other VR games clocking in at 12 plus hours. So super looking forward to that. Also, just on the same topic is DLC. They've already announced DLC for Resident Evil 7, two volumes of DLC to be exact. The first one is Band Footage Volume 1 for $9.99 US, not released yet. No exact date on that. It's going to basically come in the form of a couple of VHS tapes that you use in-game on the player to activate those modes. The second volume, Band Footage Volume 2, $14.99 US. Same thing via the VHS tapes. And probably the most puzzling thing about this is the virtual reality functionality has not been extended to that DLC. Now, hopefully between now and when they actually get launched that gets changed and certainly when it does I will mention that here and then lastly again on that game I wanted to just talk about the graphics so a lot of the reviews for the virtual reality version have basically come out to say that look it's not as good looking as the 2d uh, 3d 3d on a 2d monitor that you get in the regular mode and I kind of got that feeling just playing the original one hour demo it looked good, really good, as a lot of PlayStation games do, but you could tell it wasn't quite 1080p. But uh, in that quick look, I will let you guys know as I'm playing through kind of what I'm thinking about the graphics and my reactions to that. Uh, you know, I'm going to be blunt. If, if they've somehow dropped the ball from the demo and it's even lower scaled than that, that would suck. Hopefully that's not the case. Now, next game, Super Hot VR. It's also getting an update. This is in the form of a new challenge mode sometime in February. Those are the only details provided, but look for, forward to that. If you have touch controllers and you have not played Super Hot yet, get that game. It's a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, certainly, you know, if it's a little too costly, wait for it to go on sale and then scoop it. Definitely worth the price of admission. Now, the next game, Arizona Sunshine, like Super Hot VR, it's in my top 10 of VR games. Uh, just loved it. Of course, a lot of us are waiting for the smooth locomotion update to Arizona Sunshine. But for now, apparently, it's going to be the quickest hitting 1.4 million in a month. Quickest VR game to crush the million mark. We last talked about that with Raw Data and... The adventure game, which escapes me at the moment. The gallery, that's the one. Now, to be clear, this is $1.4 million revenue, not units sold. Units sold would be in the tens of thousands, so a huge difference there. Uh, you know, they're always a little vague on that. They never mention that. They just assume everybody's going to know. But you read that quick, you see $1.4 million, you may not be thinking you know, revenue, you may be thinking units sold. So now this next one, a Vive game is called Knockout League and it's a virtual reality boxing game. Now, haven't played any to date, even Thrill of the Fight. It's on my list. I want to give that a shot, but it seems to be a natural fit. One of the reasons I held off is I felt that the touch controllers would make better controllers for boxing because you can have that closed fist feel as opposed to the, you know, the, the Vive ones. You're punching, but really you're holding the baton in each hand. It just, it doesn't, to me, it wouldn't feel as good for a boxing game. So looking forward to that. The game is called Knockout League and uh, it's going to be available initially today in early access for $18 US also available in China on the Vive 
Port Store. So if you're watching from there. And then finally, Deus Ex Mankind Divided is getting a free virtual reality experience update. Only has a handful of environments, so there's not a hell of a lot there, but it's free. So, uh, you know, if you want to see what that game would look like in proper scaled VR, check that out. Free and uses the Vive wands as well as the gamepad. All right. So let's get into the news and talk about a uh, quote-unquote crazy camera. This according to CNET, that could be a boon to VR filmmakers. Now, we've talked a lot about cameras on this channel. And a bunch of you pointed out correctly it was something that, you know, I forgot to mention, but is important. And that is that a big difference with respect to cameras is going to be optics. The quality of the optics, the lenses. And that comment that many of you made is bang on. And like I said, as an astronomy buff with many telescopes under my belt, that should not have been one that I forgot. But absolutely, optics is going to be huge. And that's what this camera is kind of doing. It's called PMAST, P-M-A-S-T. Thankfully, no VR in the name on that one. But it is literally bulging with lenses and laced with fiber optic cables looks really good and seems to combine the best features of the high-end cameras with the mobility and handiness slash ease of use of the smaller ones like the Gear 360, for example. So very cool. There's five lens sensor modules that are mounted onto the cubic frame. I mean, this thing looks kind of like a Borg ship from Star Trek. Sorry, nerdy reference there. And that's the design that they built based on the cube ship. I mean, it looks pretty damn cool. So no idea on price or availability yet, just that it is being worked on. Now, this next story, this one is interesting because the whole topic of rating systems has caused a lot of grief for some countries when it comes to rating systems for games. And I know I've mentioned this a few times and, you know, Australian viewers to the channel have mentioned this before in agreement that, you know, there was a time in Australia where there was no mature rating. It was almost like this body was basically saying, look, adults don't play video games in Australia. It's only for kids because they had no way to accommodate mature adult content. End result, you couldn't buy it. Thankfully, mercifully, that was changed and they added the rating system. So kind of along those lines, Oculus is deploying a new rating system specifically for VR content. Now, Resident Evil being a case in point and horror in general, it has the potential to be a hell of a lot scarier in VR than the way it's normally delivered to you via your monitor. So I get that. They're trying to tweak the rating system a little bit. But the standard that they're kind of going with is a little bit different. Its acronym is IARC, which is the International Age Rating Coalition. And they want to basically, on the Oculus Store, it should be effective immediately. I didn't get a chance to check it today, but my assumption is it's already in place. And existing titles that don't have it in place. Sorry, it's effective immediately today for titles from this day forward. Existing titles have until March 1st to get that stamp of approval for that rating system. So IARC was launched in 2014. It's supposed to simplify the process for developers, whether it does or not. I know there's a few developers out there among you You'd be the best to comment on that. Yeah, I really don't know, but uh, that's the claim, that it will simplify the process for developers. You basically just answer a set of questions, and that automatically will generate the different age ratings for various territories around the world. So, yeah, from that point of view, I get it. It definitely streamlines the process, but I really wonder how they're going to phrase the questions. That's going to be key. 
you got to think they're going to ask questions about nudity and violence. It probably degrees of how subjective is some of that. So it'll be interesting to see how the responses will actually convert into rating systems and dollars to donuts, guys, somebody overlooked something. And my bet is the first week is probably going to be a gong show with this, with some hilarious results arising from a system that might not be working perfect, or I could be wrong and it works fine, but we'll find out. Next news story, HTC Vive's tracker, the new trackers that they were showing off at CES 2017 have received FCC rating. Uh, so they've passed FCC regulations. And of course, FCC and the reason why that's important, that's the American, the US agency, Federal Communication Commission. That's important because it means they can start selling it. Obviously, there's some other things they need to do before they get the full-on retail supply chain going, but it's one of the hurdles on the way to that. So that's a very promising sign and brings us one step closer to being able to purchase these trackers. Now, this next news piece is a little interesting in terms of legal considerations. So if you are a developer or a consumer interested in consumer law, this is a really good article. It's on Road to VR, and it was basically a panel, legal experts, talking to those in the industry, writers from Road to VR, about legal considerations that you know they should take into account. Developing a game, publishing a game. Matt Hooper, he's a founding partner at IME Law. He was kind of the main speaker and broke it up into, into segments. The first is how copyright works. And this was this is really interesting. Uh, again, even if you're not into law, in that VR work does not qualify as work made for hire, i.e. the same thing with a lot of software, which makes sense. What's interesting is I didn't actually realize that, that the work made for hire, which is a legal term, you know, is not something that you typically are able to do with software. And what that essentially means is it's saying that if you work for a company and you create software, it doesn't necessarily mean that that company automatically gets the rights. And that's where employment contracts, NDAs, all of that stuff comes in. But it's interesting because, you know, that could factor into the trial at some level. But back to the VR side of things, he also talked about biometric data being legally protected, which sounds pretty common sense once he mentions it, but wasn't something I had considered. And, you know, we talked about some of the haptic feedback devices, some of them measuring your heart rate. Well, that's biometric data, simplified, but it is biometric data. So it'll be interesting because in those cases where you seek to you know, gather biometric data, you need the end user's permission. Now, is it enough to embed that into an EULA, like one of those end user license agreements that you typically see for games or software? I don't know. I'm not a legal expert, but it's an interesting point. Anyways, don't need to go into all of them. They're fairly legalese after those two that I talked about. But still, if that's something you're interested in, link in the description below. And then this last news piece for today, Google has opened the floodgates to let more developers submit Daydream apps. And this is big because, and it's no big secret, it has not been selling the Daydream view near as well as Google hoped it would. So we've thrown that figure around for Gear VR of around 5 million units being out there. Nowhere near that, probably in the low tens of thousands for Daydream. And a lot of apps, you know, that haven't even been installed. So in other words, they've been looking at the metrics for apps installed and it is very low, which is troubling this early. Now, some of that could be due to just, you know, there being a lot of saturation in the market. But the fact that it's mobile and it's specific to Pixel phones, you would think there'd be a bit of a higher adoption rate. But maybe those people are just taking a uh, look and wait and, you know, they decide at a future point 
to purchase. So very interesting. They go into specifics um, on their website. Again, link through the Upload VR News article for that. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that can turn the tide a little bit because ultimately they had hoped to be a viable competitor to Gear VR and that as you know, for now, up to now, has not been the case. All right, guys, that is it for VR News. Cheers.